All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Abigail Griff. I'm a strategy analyst with Lineate. Um, I'm responsible for looking at healthcare industry news, regulations, different changes in, in the industry, um, and their opportunities or implications to our customers here at Lineate. Um, today, we'll be conducting a panel of experts on health information exchange and interoperability focused on the trusted exchange framework and common agreement, also known as TEPCA. And before I get into introductions, um, TEFCA is an initiative designed to allow for the exchange of electronic health information on a national scale. So essentially, TEFCA is a single uh, on-ramp for data exchange through the adoption of a single universal framework. Um, but again, before I introduce our great panel that we have here today, I encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. I'll be monitoring the chat during the session, and I, I really look forward to hearing um, from all of you on, on the line. Um, all right, so let's get into introductions. Um, we have five panelists here today. Our first panelist we have is Sean Alfreds, the Executive Director and CEO of Health InfoNet. And Health InfoNet provides health information exchange, real-time messaging analytics, public and population health reporting, data integration services to over 850 public and private organizations um, across the state. In addition to his role at Health InfoNet, Sean also serves as the president and CEO of Curious Innovations, which is the health information inter interoperability and technology consulting company serving other HIEs and IT vendors in the public and private sectors. The next panelist we have here is George Gooch. He is the CEO of the Texas Health Services Authority, also known as THSA, a public-private partnership responsible for private and secure exchange of electronic health information in the state of Texas. Um, part of George's responsibility is, is to manage the state's health information exchange program known as HIE Texas. Uh, the next panelist that we have here today is David Muntz. He's principal and co-founder at Starbridge Advisors. He worked as the CIO at Texas Health Resources, then at Baylor Healthcare System before spending two years as the first principal deputy national coordinator at the ONC as appointed by the White House. Um, again, he's now back in the private sector as principal and co-founder at Starbridge Advisors. Next up, we have Dr. Laura McCrary, president and CEO of the Kansas Health Information Network. Um, and it's DBA Kanza, um, an organization that prov provides na na uh, nationwide health information exchange services, data science as a service, clinical alerting, quality reporting, and analytics for providers, payers, patients, researchers, and public health. And last but not least, Dr. Tim Pletcher, the executive director of Michigan Health Information Network Shared Services, also known as MIHIN, a public and private nonprofit collaboration dedicated to improving healthcare experience, improving quality, decreasing costs for Michigan's people um, by making valuable data available at the point of care through statewide health, health information sharing. So with all that being said, thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to all of us here um, and inform us on what you know about TEFCA. We know that TEFCA is uh, an initiative that is not new, uh, but in recent news has been um, put out there and now we have a timeline, you know, TEFCA is rolling out. Uh, we have gotten the, uh, the, the, um, the technical framework ha has been published, the draft version. We've gotten the draft version of the Kyman Agreement and some eligibility cri criteria for those qualified health information networks. So let's just like dive right in and, and, uh, and, and open up the poll to uh, open up a poll to the group to see who here has actually even heard of TEFCA um, to kind of level set our questions that we have for the group. Oop. Okay. And we'll give it just a few seconds for you to go ahead and vote. How well do you actually know TEFCA? Um, if you're if you have an expert understanding or you're, you're not at all, that's perfectly fine. Um, all right, awesome. Oh. Okay. All right, we have a lot coming in. I'll just give it another minute or so. Okay. 
Okay, great. Well, while we're waiting for the question to be answered, Laura, let's start with you. Uh, can you discuss a little bit about the trusted exchange framework and exactly what that is made up of? You know, we, we hear the word common agreement and we hear the word uh, trusted exchange, but what is that, exactly is that? Uh, thanks, Abby. Um, sure, I appreciate mm -hmm. having the opportunity to talk to the group today. So uh, the trusted exchange framework is really the future of how we will share data across the nation. And so many of you are probably familiar with regional health information exchanges or statewide health information exchanges. And, and all of those have a place and have been very valuable. But when you um, have a patient that perhaps is from Kansas, which is where I'm from, and you want to take your kids down to Florida to, to go to, to Disneyland, um, and somebody needs to go to the hospital, it's really important that mm -hmm. you're able to get the information from Kansas down to the doctor um, that's treating your child at the hospital in Florida. And so what TEFCA will be able to do is establish the framework for qualified health information networks, so a, a series of, of national networks that will all share information with each other so that we can move that data quickly and easily to the doctor in Florida so that he or she can take care of your child that's been hurt who uh, lives in Kansas and has her primary care doctor in Kansas. And so at, at the very sort of um, highest level, what we're establishing here are the guidelines for the different organizations, the QKINs, and we'll talk about those a bit more as we go through this, to be able to share data with each other. That was a really great high level uh, overview of exactly what TEFCA is, because it looks like 64% of our audience today have not heard of TEFCA. So I think we are right on track for kind of uh, diving in here. Um, this slide here, I just wanted to show uh, an overview of the timeline associated with TEFCA. So feel free to take a peek at that uh, for the attendees. And then this will just be a static slide. We keep up here, just high level overview. But um, Tim, can you speak a little bit more about exactly what a QHIN is? Like, can you give a little bit more detail on, on what a QHIN actually is? I know that we hear that term a lot, but what does that mean? Yeah, so a QHIN is a qualified health. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the, the model for TEFCA is that there will be this umbrella organization drawn there is that nice pretty picture of an umbrella uh, <laughs> called the, the regional coordinating entity. And underneath that organizing umbrella, which is actually an organization that sort of kind of works with all of these little hubs, these hubs are called QHINs. And each QHIN is sort of a network. And so when you look at this picture, you can see that it's essentially a network of networks. And each QHIN has responsibility to be able to connect in turn to its own networks, as well as individual participants who might plug directly into the QHIN. And so what you end up with is this sort of mesh topology underneath the umbrella organization, where it doesn't matter which QHIN you connect to, you can connect to everybody else in the country. And each of the QHINs is really expected to follow a consistent set of technology standards, a consistent set of ways to behave, and a common set of expectations about how quickly they respond and share data, and the rules that they pass on down to their, their participants and member networks. Great, thank you. Um, and Sean, can you expand a little bit on, on what the, the common agreement piece of, of TEFCA is? like? What do uh, organizations need to know about the common agreement language? The common agreement is set up to help to, to create essentially a master legal arrangement that allows for um, appropriate sharing of information securely, but also privately um, um, from the umbrella down through the QHINs and ultimately to the participants and, and the organizations that work with the participants at whatever level they are from a treatment payment or operations. These, these agreements are, tend to be very complex um, in, in the interoperability world. Um, we have HIDs all across the country using very, very complex and sometimes different um, uh, legal agreements. What, 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 the, what, the, what the common agreement does is, is it sets up a common framework for legal understanding of what interoperability means um, and sets the rules of the road for 
the, the requirements um, from the organizations to share and how that data can be used by other participants querying and retrieving on that, that larger framework. It includes things like the HIPAA requirements under business associate requirements, and et cetera, but it also includes data rules, so the road, um, and data use type agreements that, that all organizations that are participating within TEFCA are bound to. Great, that was a that was a great overview of, of that piece. I know right now, currently, the common agreement is um, is published, and they're they're uh, requesting uh, stakeholder feedback on that. So it'll be interesting to see what the final rule uh, or the final the final uh, version of that looks like. Um, George, has your organization been focused on um, dissecting any pieces of the QTF or the common agreement? So we've definitely been keeping a close eye throughout this uh, process of development of, of TEFCA, the Trusted Exchange Framework, the Common Agreements, um, designation of the RCE. Um, currently, we're going through that uh, that that QTF or QHEN technical framework document, reviewing that mm -hmm. um, to primarily at this point to be able to disseminate information um, about what are the next steps of the process? How do people participate in Texas? How is this going to roll out? Uh, mm -hmm. Texas is a very uh, big state um, in so many ways. Uh, uh, health information exchange wise, we have a state level health information exchange network and we have multiple regional health information exchange networks. And then uh, participants that participate at multiple levels. Um, so uh, in many ways, you know, Texas has been living versions of this framework um, you know, for a while now, and it's really good to see structure put around that. Great. Yeah, and your fellow Texan, David. <laughs> David, can you speak a little bit about the RCE and the role that, that they play within all of this? I know uh, your former ONC experience um, you, you know, in our previous conversations, you've, you've, uh, you've worked with Marianne Yeager um, with the Sequoia Project and kind of have a little bit of history there. So I'd like to hear your, your, your take on that and um, any insights you have there. I think David, we might have lost David, but that's okay. We will just jump right into- No, I'm um, right here, sorry. Oh, no, you're I'm, here. I'm here. Yeah, just, okay. If you don't mind, just a little bit of history to help you understand why it is that we've got these regulations. And even though I served at ONC, my, what I was trying to do is make sure that we didn't do uh, regulations if we didn't have to. Um, but I had a lot of experience in Texas working in the Dallas area, setting up an original HIE. Um, and all the elements that you see here were things that we had to develop on our own. And so if you wonder why it is that we need to do this on a national level, it's because of just what uh, Laura talked about, and that is the need to be able to exchange data across the nation um, in a very consistent way. And the fact is that unnecessary variation is really the enemy of all of us, uh, enemy of efficiency and efficacy. Um, and so as we went through this, we created at that time what we just called a contract, and it was a DERSA. It was the new term uh, that came up and um, I guess the common agreement has now uh, become a substitute or TEFCA has become a substitute for it. Um, but the thing that we found that was missing was some party who was gonna take responsibility for making sure that all the participants played consistently, that all the, um, uh, the uh, practices and processes were common and not unique. Uh, and so we tried to do that by setting up a committee that was just private entities, and most of those were providers. Um, and the fact is that the cost was borne by those providers, very expensive. Uh, and yet the, the big beneficiaries at the time we were doing this, this is in the, in the, I guess, in the early or late 2000s um, was the fact that the, the beneficiaries were primarily the payers um, who could avoid doing duplicate things. And so for the patient, they were a great beneficiary because we didn't have to test them again or charge them. 
um, but the distribution of benefits was inconsistent and the motivations for doing things was inconsistent and coming up with a really powerful ongoing approach, uh, business approach was difficult. So um, the RCE is gonna act as that oversight and governance and governance is the real key to doing this. And so they've been able to do things in a private public way um, and, and have, the, have the strength to make sure that whatever is done is both practical and pragmatic. Uh, and so I've seen the Sequoia project develop over the years. Um, it was actually started when I was at ONC and has grown to be very successful and care quality is, is obviously very successful. So I can't say enough about the fact that the RCE um, is in the right place and they do have, if you will, a nationwide view that will serve all the participants. And um, they're looking at all the people who play along the continuum, not just at the providers, not just at the payers, not just at the patients, but all the uh, participants who might want to participate. Great, yeah, and, and you, you kind of touched on a piece of uh, governance, you know, it, TEFCA is not going to be mandated at this point in time that we know of. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would like to hear, Laurie, your thoughts around, you know, what is the benefit to participating in a QHIN or, or even really digging into to TEFCA without there being any sort of mandate um, or enforcement, rather? You know, it's really what we discussed earlier. It's really the opportunity to be able to make sure that data is available at the point of care for the doctor that's taking care of, of you or your loved one, and, and you may not be actually receiving care in your home community. If you think about what's happened with COVID, and, and I can think about my own state and, and the other states that we, we provide exchanges in, often patients are being transported large distances because there's not availability of resources or beds in their home community to be able to care for them. And so there are many times they're being transported across state lines uh, to be able to find a hospital that can provide the kind of care they need. And, and the QHIN model will allow the data to be transported across state lines or even transported across the nation. So the, the idea here is that every QHIN will connect to every other QHIN um, in the network that you can see on this model. And so when, uh, when a uh, doctor needs information on a patient, they would, they would query their own QHIN, send a query to their own QHIN who, that would then transport it to every other QHIN and ask if there's information that's available for that patient that's been transported to a hospital, not within their home community or even their, in their home state. And then the information from all of the other QHINs will come back and be made available to the doctor or to the nurse that's providing care to that patient. So from a very holistic perspective, we have a longitudinal medical record then that, that is really reflective of all the places in the nation for the first time that that patient has received care. And so for some patients, that'll be really important, um, particularly as we see more and more uh, utilization of, of a wide variety of healthcare services across our nation. So probably first and foremost, it's for the improvement of patient care. Great, and and Tim, what would you say? What would you say? Um, you know, how is how is participating in a QHIN different than participating in any other national network currently? Any thoughts around it's that? Bigger. Yeah, it's bigger. <laughs> it's more. It's, well, and and and, and um, you know, we're doing a better job. It's look, it's taken us a couple decades now <laughs> to sort of put a national infrastructure in place. And so it's been a slow journey. What we think TEFCA will really do as it's implemented is accelerate uh, both the, that ability to do things in nation, uh, nationally, but also make it a lot easier and a lot faster for folks to be part of the national network and not care. And by that, I mean, right now, it's a pretty visible process. And if we can, for everybody in the country, make it an invisible process where it just sort of happens, um, then, then TEFCA is going to be a wild success. Uh, it's early, <laughs> so that's not going to happen overnight. But it, it is, you know, really, we take going up to an ATM machine, pulling out money, 
even if we're traveling across the country. And that's not really a big deal to us. I mean, it's just sort of expected. We're really shooting under Tefka to have that same kind of national effect. You don't know what goes on behind the scenes to get that all the way back to your bank. Uh, and you probably shouldn't have to. Um, right now, it's a lot more complicated in healthcare, and we want to simplify it. Great. And Sean, do you have do you have a perspective on? Um, I, I know I know Tim kind of touched on you know uh, those that are participating shouldn't really know that they're participating in a queue, and that's really the true goal of Tefka is that you don't it's it's so seamless you don't you're not even aware. But Sean, do you have a perspective on? how what 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 implications this has for a provider or what they need to be aware of from a from a health system standpoint it's a good question abigail i think you know as tim said we're really early on um and so we're, we're at we're still you know we've, we've got a lot there's been a lot of work put in Africa from onc from a lot of folks that have been doing it for a long long time but we're we're not implemented yet and so we're in the process mm -hmm. of you know, coming to the common agreement, for example, is, you know, we've got draft language out there, but it's still draft. The the, mm -hmm. the task of the framework itself is still, still draft. And and when I talk to the provider community that we work with um, in Maine, you know, there's, there's, there's a strong interest on behalf of that provider community they're seeing properly. And so the goal of TEFCA is, is a shared goal amongst all of those organizations. Um, but devil's going to be in the details. And, um, you know, even in a small state like Maine, we have, you know, 80-plus mm -hmm. EHR vendors that are, that are in play. We have Health InfoNet, which is a statewide health exchange. We, are, we participate in, 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 in national networks already today. So to get to from where we are today to, to the ideal of where TEPCA is, is going to take a lot of, it's going to take some time and alignment of those things. And as Tim said, I think, I think it's, it's all about transparency. And if we can do this well, mm -hmm. if, if this is going to be implemented well, it's got to be fully transparent, and 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 it's got it's got to we've got to in this industry as as professionals in this industry we've got to articulate the benefits of it. Great, yeah, transparency is is definitely key with with something this large. Um, David, do you have any do you have any thoughts or insights on challenges that might be out there for organizations that aren't part of large? EHRs, like those that might not yet be connected um, in the way that they might need to be in order to participate in TAFCA? No, let me, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer a question that never was asked. Um, I'm just getting ready to type it in. But one of the things that we've talked about is the fact that these are not final rules completely. I mean, they're not fully baked yet. Um, and I can tell you after spending time at ONC, one of the things that I admired the most was that every single comment that has been made on a rule gets considered. And if you read the uh, preface to the regulations, you will often see the comments that you make reflected in that uh, preface. And um, that's really important. So the people are on the call here, the people who are not participating in the panel, I would encourage you, because you have real-world experience with HIEs, um, to go ahead and take a look and please make sure that your comments talk about what's working well uh, to make sure that it's continued and the things that are challenges to you. And be sure that the regulators will read every single comment. And one of the things that people often do is ignore the fact of things that are working well. Uh, and so. If somebody objects to something that you really like, but you haven't commented on it, they're going to be the only voice that might be heard. So, again, just encourage you every time a notice for proposed rulemaking comes out or a request for comment comes out, please step up and share your real world experience. Uh, sadly, the government can't employ all the people at the HIEs who have the experience and know the implications of what they're doing. Um, so I think that's important. I, I'm really not exactly sure how to answer your question about getting people uh, who are uh, small to participate. Um, but the fact is that um, there are um, ways to access information. Um, there used to be the 
uh, regional extension centers that were out there that would help individual physicians. But I would say that if you're you, if you're lucky enough to be in the provider space, you probably have the advantage of belonging to some type of organization that is a membership organization that will have access to resources that can help you get started. Uh, and the big challenge I see is that regardless of your size, you still have to participate following the rules that everybody else does. So uh, the small providers are the ones that cause me the greatest concern. Um, there are places where you can go on the internet and look for resources. The, the simple rule that you're going to have to create, you're going to have to get educated, you're going to have to create a plan, you're going to have to understand where your data is, you're going to have to make a plan and then execute upon it. And doing that when you're trying to do everything else that's required of a provider is daunting. Um, so please ask your professional organizations for assistance. Great. And that, that was a great point to touch on of, you know, you, even if you as a provider organization or any other sort, any other healthcare organization out there that wants to place comments, reach out to those uh, vendors you might be uh, using. They might have a team that is also thinking the same thing and, and maybe can get your questions in there and addressed. Um, that's great. Thank you, David. Um, George, do you have, do you have any, um, any, perspective on what will drive an uptick in QHIN participation? Um, you know, how do you get people to participate in this sort of thing? Yeah, so that's, I think that's the most interesting part about this whole process. Um, because it is, you know, the, there are two parts, the TEF and the CA, uh, Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. And an agreement is a contract. And a contract is a voluntary relationship between two entities. We're not talking about a regulation, a law, or any other kind of rule. People, people have to want to do this, um, and I mean not just people, but you know every step of the way, all the way on to the top of this kind of network of networks model. People have to want to do it. Um, so, what's the driver for wanting to do that? Particularly, um, the exchange of health information. All of the regional health information exchange networks, they operate. Uh, locally. Um, and in most cases, if you lay down a referral pattern map over a local HIE map, you'll see um, a lot of agreements. And that is because I can never remember the exact statistic, but it's like 90, 92, 95% of all healthcare is local. So there is a very big need for health information to be exchanged locally. There's still a need for health information ex to be exchanged beyond referral patterns or beyond those boundaries of where regional HIE is set up, it is just less than the more immediate need. So uh, I, I think that's the thing that remains to be seen from all of this. Mm -hmm. There are uh, examples of, I'll say in the privacy and security industry, um, where similar frameworks have been laid out. Um, you know, what's the driver for that? And I've seen drivers come from health plans, um, payers um, who say, hey, you need to adopt this privacy and security framework. Um, if you don't, we're not going to contract with you because this is the industry standard. Um, you could very well see this uh, being something that becomes a trigger for, you know, a government agency to say as a, a prerequisite for signing up for this program, receiving these funds, you're going to need to sign this agreement. Um, but hopefully it just gets there the organic way um, mm -hmm. where you know, everyone's connecting together. It's becoming that seamless infrastructure. It's in the background. We don't really know how it's operating. It just become, it, we get to that critical mass um, and it becomes more and more that the public pressure is kind of there because it's more a minority of entities are not participating where the majority are. Um, right. But it can happen in any number of ways still to be determined so much like the rest of TEFCA. Um, and mm -hmm. that's the part I'm most excited to see what that's gonna be. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited too. I, I, it'll be interesting to see what the adoption looks like as as time goes on. Um, it looks like we have a few questions in the chat already. One being, and I'll have you, Laura, answer this one. Have QHINs been defined up until this point? Can you expand a little bit on the QHIN eligibility criteria that's been published, uh, but not yet final, and, and just some of the more specific details there? Sure. So, so 
you know, just recently, probably within the last two weeks, the draft of the QHIN eligibility requirements was released. Um, I think all of you can go find that on the internet. So if you wanted to read through it, um, you can see what the QHIN eligibility requirements are. And so these requirements are, are not surprising for those of us who have been following this work for, for a number of years. I don't think there were any surprises in the QHIN eligibility requirements. And they're the things that you would ask of any health information exchange that you were working at, either at a you know at your regional or your state or or at a national level. These are things that define good, high quality health information exchanges. That they have a strong privacy and security infrastructure, um, and and meet uh, high standards on a regular basis to ensure that that the data that the providers are entrusting to the health information exchanges is is protected. Uh, uh, obviously, you have to have a, a technical infrastructure that's going to be able to support this very robust data exchange. And I think that if I had to say, um, when I look at the challenge uh, for my organization that, that I uh, work for, Kanza, um, when I look at that amount of data exchange that is going to be required of a QHIN, that's where we're really focusing a lot of our time in, in getting ready. So just to give you an example, um, Kanza currently has about 25 million transactions each month. And so that sounds like a lot of transactions that, that we process each month, and it is, but we are gearing up to be able to process 250 million transactions each month as a QHIN. And that is going to be a requirement for the QHINs. You won't be able to be a QHIN unless you can process the amount of transactions to be able to respond to the other QHINs who are asking for information from you. So that's really the most difficult, I think, and challenging for at least our organization is to be pre prepared to move from 25 million transactions a month to 250 million transactions. And then, of course, you all, you know you have to maintain you know good insurance, cyber you know insurance, so that you, if there is any concerns that arise at some point, that you have insurance coverage. You have to have adequate financial reserves to be able to meet the requirements and ensure your you know ensure the um, provider community that you're going to be able to continue to stay in business. And so these are the kinds of things that, um, in general, you would expect of a health information exchange to be able to maintain for you. But it's a health information exchange that's functioning at a very, very high level and is prepared to be able to manage enormous numbers of transactions. And so that's, that's really what I would say that I would encourage you all to go out and read the new um, eligibility draft uh, requirements that were released a couple of weeks ago. And just think about those from the perspective of which organizations out there as a part of the provider community do you really feel comfortable with or, that are going to be able to, to serve the needs that you have. Great, that was that was awesome. And and I, I will say too, to to Laura's point, um, the information is out there on the on the internet, obviously. And uh, the Sequoia Project and the RCE have published a lot of different webinars that have really really detailed information on many of the pieces within the common agreement, and then also the uh, technical framework. So feel free to check those out. Um, we have another question here. Um, as garnering the QHIN designation as it stands today, it's a very complex proposed framework. What's the competitive advantage for an organization to look to certify on this framework rather than just expanding their HIE scope? And I think I'll throw that one to, to Tim. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a good question. I, I think a lot of HIEs uh, thought, hey, I'm gonna become a QHIN. And I think, uh, I think mm -hmm. Laura made a great point of sort of saying, why would you wanna do that, okay? And um, it's probably only going to make sense to become a QHIN for organizations that are connecting a lot of different things together across probably multiple jurisdictions. And so if you're going to cross multiple state boundaries, you might, you might be very interested in becoming a, a, a QHIN. If you're just going to serve sort of one area, you really should question, is that something that you would get competitive advantage from? And so... I've, I've heard rumors that sort of like big EHR companies might try to become their own uh, QHIN. Uh, mm. and, and that would, uh, you know, that would certainly be interesting. Um, 
the best reason I think to become a QHIN is to probably uh, have a seat at the national table. And I think to have a seat at the national table, it's gotta be bigger than any one organization. So you need to really be able to bring together multiple organizations and have a voice in addition to a QHIN at the table. And so I, I think that the competitive advantage is, you know, you as a community now can have a footprint as a QHIN and have a voice uh, among the rest of the other QHINs. But if you're just one organization and you're not bringing a community to the table, I think you really do have to question whether there's competitive advantage for you becoming a QHIN. Great question um, from the group. Yeah, and, and another piece, uh, Sean, I'll throw this one to you, but you know, many HIEs are currently operating under the same principles that TEFCA has already framed out. Do you foresee any changes being needed to, in terms of like contractual, contractual changes that need to be made um, on the final agreement? Um, well, there'll be lots of changes that will probably need to be made. Um, I think there's lots, there's still a lot of back and forth on the final common agreement. And for HIEs, as Tim said, you know, existing health information exchanges, whether they're statewide, regional, um, they're all going to have to, if they're going to participate in TEPCA, they've got to change their agreements and their downstream right. agreements uh, because there are pass-through requirements of the common agreement. And I think that's where that's where a lot of, that's where some of the devils in the details, as I talked about earlier, are that we're 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 reviewing right now. We're having concrete conversations with our with our customers as well as the EHR vendors that we work with, in addition to the national networks. Um, you know, and 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 that that's going to be a challenging conversation, I think, for some. Um, and and it's going to be something that ONC is going to have to consider: is how mm -hmm. how how different is this going to be from some of the existing national agreements that are out there we have we have a there is a national agreement that is part of the e-health exchange which supports both commonwealth and care equality which are both which are two national networks called the data use and reciprocal services agreement many hies are are signatories to that and have have been passed through the requirements of the dursa through to their sub agreements to their partners the common agreement common agreement is going to be very similar uh, and the question mm -hmm. is how similar is it going to be and what are, what are the fundamental changes that are going to have to be made? Because we all know uh, you're negotiating legal agreements with lots of healthcare providers and healthcare organizations is not easy and it's not fast. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and just to bounce off of that, um, George, has your organization been, um, been, I mean, I know that the, a lot of the language is going to be similar to the com to Commonwealth and, and care equality and e-health exchange. Mm -hmm. Have you been noticing in your review of the common agreement language, is it is it very similar? Uh, I mean, so they've got they've got principles in in Tefka that really do build on same or similar principles that are in things like the Dursa, that are in things like the agreements that are uh, relative mm -hmm. to Commonwealth care equality, things of that nature. I think the goal is not to really disrupt or change any of that, but really unify. Um, what we have are several, not several, multiple um, networks and frameworks that currently exist, even at the national level, um, that do this kind of same thing. So, I mean, I, I particularly specialize in privacy and security um, and healthcare regulatory issues. So, like, a lot of what I see, like, they're still building on HIPAA. They're still building on mm -hmm. traditional privacy and security principles. I don't think that there's anything in here that really rocks the boat. Um, but it's right. definitely <laughs> going to be making sure if, if, you're, if you're thinking of applying to be a QHIN, uh, participate in the TEFCA model, uh, signing uh, on to the common agreement, it's definitely something you want to review uh, your current legal agreements. You want to review your current policies and procedures, um, other entities that you're contracting with um, to ensure that the stars are in fact aligning on all of this stuff um, and that there's nothing that you do need to put in place first. But ideally you should have, uh, if you've got a good um, you know, trust framework in place within your organization, it shouldn't be a heavy lift, um, but it's definitely gonna be something that you can't just you know, drag and drop either. It's going to take some review mm -hmm. sometime, but that's that's the whole point of this is once you do that, um, once we get to this common agreement, 
Um, hopefully it's something that eventually it's going to be a unifying standard um, across the nation so we won't have to do something like this again. But, but yeah, it's definitely worth review at this time. Great, one big lift. Laura, did you have any anything additional to add to that? Well, you know, the, the one thing that I think is a little bit unusual that is important to point out is that uh, the common agreement is going to uh, be very clear about what the purposes of use are for the QHINs. And so for many of us and, and many organizations that have been health information exchanges for a long time, we focused on treatment. And so uh, the QHINs will be required uh, to share data for purposes of treatment payment and healthcare operations. And so this is a very important distinction and difference. Um, even for example, care quality now, um, they only share data for purposes of treatment. And so that I think is one of the key distinctions that will have to be um, addressed for health information exchanges that have agreements with their participants. You know, they're going to have to be willing to share data now for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. And I think that's important. The other thing that I think is important that is kind of new um, is this idea that the QHINs will share data with each other at no cost. And so the idea you know, is simply that the participants under the QHINs will be the organizations that pay some form of dues or, or subscription fees but the QHINs themselves share information with each other at no cost. So I think both of those are kind of interesting pieces of the way the mm -hmm. network and the structure is developing and, and important to think about um, as, a, you know, as a provider or in the provider community. Great, that was, that was definitely great, great detail there. Um, David, can we have a question here? Can a patient just join as an individual person, or do they do they need to be a member within a QHIN uh, organization? The <laughs> great question. There are many different ways that a person can sign up for uh, to, to participate in an HIE, and I'll defer to the HIE people on the phone to talk about how they do that in a particular area. But there's also direct. Uh, which is independent messaging capability. Um, so I'll, if you don't mind, push that off to somebody who's who's doing that work on a regular sure. basis. Sure. Tim, would you mind uh, elaborating on that a little bit? Can an individual person um, join in a QHIN or any thoughts there? Uh, an individual person cannot really be, would not meet the criteria to become a QHIN. Okay. Um, but an individual person can sort of leverage the QHIN infrastructure to get at their information. And so um, as the different participants are connected to a QHIN and the QHIN is sort of connected to all the other QHINs, based on the rules that each uh, network that that participant is connected to, uh, then they, they can actually, you know, find their way back to sort of get that information. But, um, treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, and under the HIPAA private right of access, uh, patients would have access to their own information sort of under this infrastructure. But they can't go right up to a, a QHIN um, per se and say, here, give me all my data. They have to kind of go through one of those participant organizations or one of those HIEs that offers a patient-facing service. Got it. So they have to go through the appropriate channels in order to get the, their information. Makes sense. All right. Awesome. Another question that we have here, and I'll, I'll push this one to Sean. Um, any idea where consent will be managed in the exchange process? That's a good question. Um, consent typically is managed at the provider level. Um, and, 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 and that's really important and critical here and ties into the consumer access piece too um, that we just talked about. Um, you know, our healthcare is delivered by the provider community. Um, our healthcare services are delivery services. And there's a, there's a HIPAA notice of privacy practices that's presented to all of us as consumers um, when, when we're receiving care. And within that notice of privacy practices is the data sharing activities that that, um, that organization is allowed to um, 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 participate with. Um, and, and, and that's that's where the provider organization gives notice to the patient. And that's where consent 
needs to happen is at, is at that level. Um, each state has different privacy laws for consent, and so this is this is one of those alignment pieces that needs to be brought to the table. But that's a local um, uh, tends to be a local issue, um, and then and then you know whether it's through the HIE whether it's through the HIE or um, or some other network the EHR networks then then that information is 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 to be shared through um, through the common agreement. You know, it's interesting, the common agreement calls forth and it allows for um, patient facing um, um, applications. So this is another new thing that's in TEFCA that is not in some of the, some of the other national data, data sharing frameworks. So there, there are gonna be means by which patients can get access and potentially, hopefully, um, can control consent as well. Um, we'll that'll be one of the areas that I think is, is gonna be expanded upon and um, um, explored as this gets implemented. Great, and David, did you have any other additional thoughts there? Uh, yes, uh, just to let you know, I believe, and I, I, I don't wanna mislead anybody, but as I read it, and they intentionally are not gonna address consent right now. On the other hand, ONC has um, addressed the issue and they call it meaningful consent. Um, and it'll give you a little more insight into all the different flavors uh, of consent that are necessary. Uh, but the answer that was just given is terrific and spot on. It's the difficulty of dealing with all the different consents across the country um, that I see the greatest challenge uh, will be. Great, thank you for that. Another question we have here is the TEFCA centralized model allows for QHINs to unencrypt patient data before sending it on to the receiving organization. This will allow QHIN to mine and sell that data. Why was it architected this way and not in a way that protects patient data? Let's throw that one at Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Why was it architected this way? So, um, uh, there's a lot of great things you can do at the QHIN level. And let me just give you a simple example. And, and remember, these QHINs have to have a business model too, right, for sustainability. Mm -hmm. But right. let's just say that uh, an alert comes through that a patient has gone to an emergency department. Okay, they showed up in the emergency department. The QHIN is connected to a lot of different things where it could look at that information and it could say, oh my goodness, there is a bunch of information that we want to send right now to that emergency department uh, before they go and, and treat this person. And so that's a great place for the QHIN to decrypt that information, query a couple of the other QHINs to get some additional data and essentially enrich that data stream with new information that does a better job of taking care of the patient. And so, the ability to add value at that point in the process is really a critical opportunity to, to take advantage of the aggregation that we're trying to put together for the, for the whole country here. And so it's not some Machiavellian plot to steal people's data. It's actually to create these, these sort of points of aggregation where you can do a much better job because you're sort of higher on the mountain to pull things together and, and make a difference for the patient that if you're just in the ED kind of getting this alert, you, you may not know. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure other folks want to chime in on here, but uh, you know, it, 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 it's not to steal patient data by any means. So any others want to chime in? Yeah, yeah. So again, I just want to go back to TAFCA, Trusted Exchange Framework, Common Agreement. Agreement is a contract, a voluntary relationship between parties. Um, you cannot contract away. You cannot contract for something that is illegal. Um, that makes a contract null and void. Like you can't, you can't contract to sell illegal drugs and contraband to people. It doesn't make it legal. Speaking like a lawyer, contract no. it. Sorry, I generally don't lead with the fact that I'm a lawyer. It makes people like me better when they don't find out right away. Um, but I will also say um, the sale of protected health information is an item that is covered both under HIPAA and high tech. So there are guardrails around that. Again, this is just the, the uh, framework and common agreement for uh, transport and exchange of the data. That's going to make it easier for all the reasons that uh, Tim mentioned. But yeah, like 
we're definitely safe in that regard. Definitely a, a lot of helpful laws and regulations that help prevent just that scenario. Great, that should reassure any of those that are afraid of uh, information being stolen. Stolen. We got an LOL from the group. <laughs> um, all right, so Laura, um, will do you know if uh, Q hints will be subject to 21st Century Cures Act? I'm sorry, say it again, Abby. Sure, we have a question. Will Q hints be subject to the 21st Century Cures Act? Well, actually, the 21st Century Cures Act was where the QHINs were first and initially defined. That's where the legislation was put in place to uh, begin to establish the idea of the of the network that you see here. And so, I so I'm I'm not I'm I think maybe this question is going towards information blocking. I'm I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure, but but um, QHINs will be subject to information blocking just as uh, health information exchanges are now. And so for those of you who are following the information blocking regulations and, and HIEs follow these very closely because HIEs are subject to a million dollar fine in the event that they actually are knowingly engaging in information blocking. So all of uh, you know, the, the folks on, on this call today and, and the HIE leaders that you have in your states are very, very attuned to the fact that HIEs must share information with other HIEs and must share information um, so that patients can have their medical records available at the point of care. And QHINs will not be able to information block um, in, in any form or fashion. And, and that, would, that would, I'm sure, rise to the level of a QHIN um, being um, you know, really focused on by the RCE who will be overseeing the sort of the regulatory and the, um, the, the work associated with the QHIN relationships. So I, I think that's where they're going on the information blocking, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think your, your assumption is correct. Um, with, the, with that, if a, if a, I'll kind of just do a follow up for you, Laura, if a, if a participant in a QHIN if, if a provider organization or any health organization is participating in a QN, can is that enough as far as information blocking? Is that enough proof that that, that organization is not um, information blocking? Well, I would say no, it's probably not enough. Um, just the participation in a QN, um, that that's a good start, but you've got to make sure that that your organization is not uh, potentially blocking information at the EHR level or or for another purpose. And so, you know, it just because a uh, provider is participating in a QHIN doesn't necessarily mean they aren't blocking information at their own level. So, so I, I mean, I, I'm not sure what the rest of my colleagues would think on that, but but I would I would. If, if, it, if an organization is blocking information, it doesn't really matter at what level they are at. They're blocking information. Yeah, I guess I'll add a bit. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Laura is spot on. Like participating in a QHIN and health information exchange generally is going to go a long way to helping comply with the information blocking rule for those requests that are coming through that network. However, information blocking is definitely something that should be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so it's not going to make, I mean, it's not even going to be relevant to your healthcare organization's compliance for, you know, a patient that presents at a hospital to request their own information. Um, that decision to, to share or deny is going to be subject to information blocking. Um, so this definitely helps, but it's not going to help. It's not going to be, you know, set it and forget it, um, but it, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely not going to hurt you. <laughs> I was going to say, Wait, I, anything I, else it, to add gonna, there, gonna, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, it's a good measure. I mean, so it, you, you'll demonstrate full participation and not just writing a check to the QN or the HIE, right, but actually sharing data. Um, but if, if, if I, I could foresee if you had a pattern of denying certain kinds of requests that went through the QHIN to one of your competitors, for example, like you just didn't want to give them data, um, mm -hmm. then, you know, that'd be a problem, even though you were sharing data with everybody else in the country relative to, uh, to the QHIN. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you could get yourself in trouble if you're information blocking. 
regardless of whether you're part of a of a Q hit. But you know, you're certainly right, making a good faith effort if you're broadly sharing data through the Q hint. And I, and I think that it is important. Great. So for those on the call, it's a, it's a good step, but you know, still still important to be uh, you know, up to date on those those information blocking regulations. So the question was related to the Q hint providing patient direct access to their data. So Tim, can you kind of expand on that piece? So I think that was what the original question was was supposed to be focused on was more of the patient patient access piece of the 21st century cures. Oh, for the consumer API? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, to, to my knowledge, the publishing of the consumer API, like health plans are required to do, is is not a specific QHIN function. Uh, at right. least it's not been articulated in the framework. Um, in fact, a lot of the fire uh, technology standards and specs have not been defined at all relative to TEFCA. And so there's some, um, there's some requests and development going on right now, but all of those sort of fire facing consumer app APIs, uh, you know, at least with the current releases of information are, are not uh, established as a requirement, at least not that I've seen anywhere. Any, anybody else right, seen I... where the, the sort of fire API Access has been a requirement of a QN. No. No. Nope. Yeah, that was gonna be that was gonna be one of my questions too. Was you know, we're in the early stages of Tefka, but where's fire? <laughs> and uh, Sean, do you have any insights onto you know, will fire be incorporated, and do you foresee um, fire not in, being included in Tefka being uh, you know, uh, slow adoption? based on that because a lot of people are very fire minded right now. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say fire fire is gonna be a part of Tefka no matter what. Um, fire is, mm -hmm. is 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 quickly becoming um, the preferred standard for interoperability at all levels. Um, and and especially getting to discrete and granular um, um, data sharing, which is you know to, to the conversation earlier about data aggregation points, fire is going to help facilitate that process much better, smoother, and include the concepts of consent much more readily than um, than other standards that we're using today. So I think it's going to be a part of that. You know, as far as you know, I, I think the way I see the framework going, it's going to iterate over time, and standards are going to be added over time as the framework gets built, and that's that's that that's a good thing. Uh, but I, I I do perceive fire becoming part of almost every transaction over time. Great. Yeah, I think we've seen well, that well. that will be part of the, the roadmap. So um, to be determined, I suppose, on that front. Um, looks like we have I, another I, question. I, I, oh, sure, I go would ahead, go even, Yeah, I'd go even further and say if FIRE doesn't get into the TEFCA roadmap, then TEFCA will fail. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it's, yeah. it's that critical. And so I don't think anybody involved with TEFCA has any expectation that we're not going to fully embrace FIRE and, and really solve for um, you know, taking advantage of, of the momentum behind fire. Great, and and Laura, we have another question here. I'll throw this one to you. Is there an estimate as to how long it will take for Tefka to go from being in this draft status to actually being a functional network that can then be utilized by participants and subparticipants? Well, I can tell you what we've been planning for, and I think that um, it's coming to fruition that we're beginning to see when this is actually going to to move from just a conversation to actually having a, a true network. You know, the um, we are anticipating, and I say this from Kansas perspective, that um, you know the the common agreement will be available in um, Q1 of of 2022. And, and at that point, there will become an application process to become a QHIN. We are anticipating that that application process will occur at some point during Q2 of 2022. QHINs will get awarded towards the end of that time frame. This is what we expect. Nobody knows this for sure, but we expect that right. they'll be awarded somewhere towards the end of um, Q2 in 2022, maybe you know, next, next summer and that the QHINs then will begin the process probably around this time next year 
of beginning to work with each other, beginning to have conversations about the technical connections that are going to be necessary to connect to each other. And there will be a slow and gradual build of that connectivity probably over the next 18 months. So our expectation, and, and we've communicated this to our vendors, including Lineate, um, is that by um, tw 2023, um, really two years from now, we expect that we're going to need to be at that 250 million transactions a month that we talked about before, because we do mm -hmm. think there'll be broad connectivity between the QHINs by that time. So that's sort of what we're planning for. And uh, we think that that's probably fairly close in terms of what the what the timeline is going to be in, in the transition process. Now, you know, there's always things that that, you know, kind of, you know, catch us off guard. You know, COVID certainly delayed the time frame on this a bit. But um, I think that it's reasonable to expect that two years from now we will have a, a, a functioning um, structure in place, infrastructure in place to be able to share data across the nation. Super exciting. <laughs> Lots of work to be done, right, in, in a short period of time. Uh, we have another question here, and, and this is something here at Lydia we've we've kind of been having on our radar, is uh, certain states, uh, individual, individual states are passing requirements and mandating HIE connectivity from, you know, providers to payers to HIE, uh, to the to the, H, the state HIE. So uh, do you think, George, that there's, you know, are, are these new laws at maybe at odds with TEFCA? Any any thoughts there? Uh, We've seen it with St. Helens and Nebraska. And, yeah. yeah, we definitely don't have the problem in Texas of uh, people mandating uh, connectivity <laughs> to the state. <laughs> um, uh, it, it would be a, a welcome problem, but probably something that's not uh, tenable in the grassroots state of Texas. Um, so. Uh, I guess the question is, is like they give California as an example, they're mandating connectivity to the state HIE. Is that at odds with anything that is in TEFCA? Um, I, I would imagine no off the top of my head. Um, and I, I guess if it, if it were though, because uh, this came up a lot in the early days in the development of eHealth Exchange, um, or at the time, Nationwide Health Information Network, and like, what are we gonna do if there's like a difference in law between like a state privacy law in Minnesota versus Arizona or, or something of that nature, and they can't exchange. And you know, the way I always said it was like, well, if there's like such a dramatic issue, which generally, you know, there generally are not um, um, at the state level, then, you know, entities in that state need to give forethought to participating in national networks if it's going to put them, you know, at odds with state law. Um, and that's something for the state to sort out. And, you know, it just takes more time. But I don't think that's really what we saw um, under, uh, you know, when eHealth Exchange uh, or Nationwide Health Information Network, which later became eHealth Exchange, um, first um, came about, and I don't think that we're going to see it again today. Great, and I know Laura, we we've spoke about this on on a call um, prior to this. Um, you know, again with the HIE connectivity and the mandates, and California being one, Nebraska being one. Um, this isn't new news necessarily, but it just seems that there's been this trend recently that we've had these mandates come out. Do you think that this will help with the adoption of participating in TEFCA, or do you think it might hinder um, since many states will already be connected? You know, um, I have not found, I'm, I haven't found that mandates work very well in Kansas either. Um, and, and so I, I guess the thing that I would rather focus on are, are what are the really positive things that will encourage providers to want to participate in QHINs? And, and there are some things that we do know that work. And, and so when you think about what does work, what does work is really providing incentives to the provider community to participate in health information exchange. And those incentives can be a wide variety of things, but one that's fairly effective is to be able to provide financial incentives 
to participating in health information exchange and participating in, te in TEFCA and with ACUHIN. And so, mm -hmm. you know, for example, if the payer community, and I say that broadly, um, meaning, you know, both governmental payers and, and also commercial payers, if the payer community is providing incentives to participate in health information exchange, it's, uh, it's one of those things that we've seen be very successful across the nation that providers actually that are going to make the investment, uh, and it is a significant investment um, to, to connect to a health information exchange. Uh, if they're gonna make the investment and they're gonna continue to participate, that, that there should be some um, opportunity for them to have a return on that investment. And so, so one of the things that we really encourage is, the, is thinking about, instead of penalizing you know, organizations or, or, or making mandates, let's think about the positive ways to really encourage the provider community to participate. And I think those really are about the opportunity to receive financial um, incentives in, for doing so. Can I jump great. in on there? The, yeah. And I think it's yeah. a great point that you're making. Laura, the thing that I think we're ignoring a bit here, it's a huge um, pin up demand for people to be able to manage their own information. And so it's going to be the patients and families that I think will re force people to join the HIEs, to join, to make sure that you're connected to a QHAM because they want to be able to manage their own information in their own lives more effectively than they can now. Um, and so I think the big issue that we're going to have is coming up with reasonably easy metaphors to help explain to the populace a, as a whole what it is that TEFCA brings, what the Cures Act brings, how it is that they're able to participate and how they're going to benefit from being able to get the information that they need. And it's the same thing. It's like we are creating a new network for tel telephony, if you will. So we're way over simplification with a lot of problems. But if you explain the advantage of having a telephone to somebody, everybody would want to do it. If you explain the advantage of being able to get at your health information with less effort than it takes now to manage, I don't think anybody wouldn't want to participate uh, with a provider who, who is a part of the um, HIE slash or the QN. That's a, that's a really great point. Um, you know, that's what we've been seeing. It seems like since the start of COVID, there has been this push. And, you know, it, it also in combination with the 21st Century Cures Act, you know, patients want their, their healthcare data information and there's a lot of digital innovation going on right now to do so. So I, I can definitely see that, that that's a great point that you touched on there, David, um, with the patient education being a, a big piece of that. Um, all right, it looks like we have another question here on consent. Uh, will all levels in the chain need to verify consent information in some form? And I'll throw this one to Tim. Yeah, there's a provision in the way the exchange is, is, is the messaging is set up so that they sort of carry the consent um, line. It says, you know, I, I kind of have, have a justification for this kind of request. So even in the new hint, you know, going way back, um, there's there's been a space to sort of push, uh, you know, yeah, yes, I have permission to kind of make this request. Um, whether every stop along the chain has to um, get a new request, that's that's not in the model. So you know, you can sort of verify that that that, that the consent exists as it's sort of pushed along but you're not stopping the flow and getting the new patient consent each time. You're, you're basically trusting the end point who's making the request and the, the, the demonstration that they have the right to make that request. Um, you're, you're looking at it there and then you're passing it along, but everybody can, can kind of open up that field and see that there's something there. Great, and, and Lara, can you, can you touch on a little bit the flow down requirements. There's this piece within the QTF. Um, you know, most of it is this QHIN to QHIN exchange that's called out and in, in, in the specific details on how to do that. But most of, you know, there's there's only going to be maybe a handful of, of actual eligible QHINs and those that are accepted um, by the RCE. But what is 
what does it mean for provider organizations as far as those requirements that then flow down and maybe even uh, participants and then also some participants within that network? So this is a um, kind of a, a, an important part of the way the QHINs are structured is that the common agreement requirements will flow down uh, to the participants and then to the sub-participants and then, you know, sub-sub-participants underneath that. And so for a lot of, of, of health information exchanges who might be participants in a QHIN, uh, this will be an important component that they need to be thinking about now because many of the participation agreements that are in place between health information exchanges now and their participants will not include all of the provisions that are required um, under the common agreement. So, you know, when, when we became a member of eHealth Exchange, um, you know, a number of years ago, the same kind of uh, requirement was in place that we needed to flow down the eHealth Exchange DURSA uh, to, our, to our participants and then if there were sub-participants underneath them. And so that was an important part of our work that continues uh, to this day is, is to make sure that when we are onboarding new organizations, they understand that, that as a part of signing our participation agreement, they also agree to the requirements for um, eHealth Exchange. And now as we moved in, into TEFCA, they also agree to the common agreement and, and the requirements associated with that. With, with TEFCA. So a good example of this that will be a little bit problematic is the requirement to share data for purposes of treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. This is kind of a, sometimes a difficult place for the provider community to think that they're gonna be providing information to payers. Uh, now, now we, you know, the truth is, is that the healthcare community has been making that information available to payers on their members through a wide variety of, of other means, but maybe not necessarily through health information exchange and, or through the QHINs. So that'll be something that you've got to think about in terms of the flow down provisions of the common agreement is to make sure that all of your participants agree to do that. And, and mm -hmm. if you have a participant that says no, I, I don't want to do that, I will not make the data available, um, then, then actually they're not gonna be able to participate in your QVIN. Now they can go and, and, and participate in some other health information exchange that isn't a part of a QHIN or they can try to do it on their own, but they won't be able to participate in a QHIN if they don't agree to the provisions of the common agreement. And the QHINs will flow those down. So think about that many health information exchanges that are small exchanges are not going to be able to be a QHIN. And so they'll join up with a QHIN. So you'll see a QHIN that'll have multiple health information exchanges. Some of those might be regional exchanges. Some of them might be, you know, uh, statewide exchanges. And so the QHIN will flow those down to its participant, which might be a statewide health information exchange, who will then flow it down to the sub-participants that will be the doctors in the hospitals that have been a part of that organization. And, and, and so consequently, that flow down provision will be really important to pay attention to for everyone involved. Great, and and just to kind of go off of that, Sean, is there is there a need for a uh, participant or sub-participant to be involved in more than one QHIN? Is there any benefit to that? Um, you know, I've heard that that asked a number of times, and, and I think a lot of people are talking about that. You know, the idea here, though, is that if you if, if a participant or sub-participant is participating in one QHIN, the QHINs are connecting to each other. And, mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and again, this gets to the seamless concept that we talked about. This network of networks, if you're in one and working with one, then you're supposed to be able to work with all of the others. Where there may be advantages or disadvantages to, to participating with more than one QHIN, as this plays out, will be in, in, in the service side of the house. QHINs are gonna be our businesses, right? And they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna provide the QHIN service and other services tied to being a QHIN, and they've got, they've got to generate revenue. So there might be one QHIN that's offering a set of patient-level patient applications that a participant may want to provide downstream to their, to their sub-participants, whereas another QHIN may not. So that, that, may, mm -hmm. that may cause choices one way or the other. Um, you know, and, and again, there's also the business side. One QHIN may be charging a different, have a different business model than another. So, so we're, we're going to see that, that, that play out, but 
the way the framework was developed and is, is developed today, once you're connected to one QHIN, that data is supposed to flow across all of the QHINs. Great, and, yeah, that and is the And you're only supposed goal. to connect to one QHIN in the current framework. <laughs> okay. Right? Point them. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, everybody, but, but uh, you know, the, the current model uh, under Tufka is that everybody connects to one and only one QHIN. And what we've seen in any environment that has multiple HIEs or multiple RIOs that, that can kind of offer competing services or just different portfolios of services is that Americans want choice and flexibility so telling people they can only do one thing generally <laughs> is not well received. So uh, I, ha I foresee that at some point down the road, folks will say, I wanna buy this from that QHIN, I wanna buy that from this other QHIN, and uh, you all sort it out to not create a big routing loop for where my data goes. So, um, you know, that, that joy is in front of us. It's one of those devils in the details that, that Sean has <laughs> kind of <laughs> You heard it here first. Um, I guess another another question that I have is, and Laura, you kind of touched on this. You know, uh, not every HIE is going to be able to be a Q head, right? Like, I think the I think a common expectation among people just generally talking is like it, their assumption is that an HIE would be a Q head, but we know after having our conversation today, that's not necessarily the case. Not everybody is as equipped to do so. Do you foresee, Tim, there being, or I guess, George, either either of you, any of you, actually, do you foresee a consolidation further of the HIE market? Or do you see a change in how the HIEs kind of help to connect those? Or is there any change in services that are provided? I, I certainly see there being a consolidation uh, in the sort of traditional uh, HIE market. But I also see an explosion of people trying to create brand new community-based organizations, right? To, to solve, I'll call them non-EHR yeah. problems. And I also see county governments um, trying to do data exchange, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, larger counties still. And so, so I think what, what's gonna happen is you'll see a lot, of, a lot of organizations shuffle over to this health utility infrastructure kind of mindsets. Why you're seeing states kind of sort of mandate connectivity is they're going, the world's bigger than the EHR. I got all this stuff I got to connect. And so mm -hmm. I think what you'll, you'll see is that this evolution begin to happen. You will see a consolidation, but you'll also see kind of new entrants and new business opportunities for the interoperability challenge, but it's going to be bringing in social services and child welfare and county jails and schools. And so the evolution will not be, how do I connect to, you know, Epic to Cerner? It'll be much more, how do I solve society problems? And I think a lot of the HIE space that's currently occupied with EHRs and doctors is going to shift over to that, you know, how do we become a utility infrastructure for data sharing more broadly? So they won't go away, but they might consolidate pretty substantially if they're just focused on treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Great. Anything to add there, George? No, nothing. I was going to say something, but what Tim said sounded so much better <laughs> than whatever I was going to say. So let's just <laughs> let's have that be a joint answer from, from me and Tim. I'll just give awesome. some credit for it. Awesome. And that looks like we have a little bit more of a technical question here from Megan. Um, it does not appear that requesters, either as IAS or other participants, are required to meet any identity Proofing standards such as IAL2, why? Anyone comfortable answering that question? If not, we can take that one offline and get back to you. All right. Awesome. Well, I think this has been a really great session. Is there any like final thoughts that you have for those that might be on the line today? Like how they can prepare for this, what they can be looking for, what they might need to do? I'll start with you, Tim. I think I think that if you are tracking this very closely, then I think you are probably um, well positioned. If you think you're going to become a QHIN and you haven't been tracking this very closely, 
you probably need to reevaluate what you're telling your leadership. Okay. Um, if you, if you've been kind of doing this hand waving and saying, Hey, we're going to, yeah, we're going to be a, a cue in, we'll get a, we'll get around to that. Okay. Um, I think you may want to step back and, and kind of look around and see who has been tracking this very closely, who is clearly arming themselves to tackle this sort of new challenge and look at partnering with them. Because I, I think that uh, what's becoming more and more clear is this is not for the faint of heart. This is not a just kind of flip a switch and it's all going to work kind of thing. This is kind of a big deal. The other thing is I think the common agreement and the magnitude of educating the general counsels and the privacy officers and all the provider organizations across the country is the big lift. Um, because I don't know as if everybody is really understanding all of, of that. And so I think there's going to be an amazing amount of, of education yet to occur. And so I would be worrying less about becoming a, a QHIN and more about educating everybody about the content and expectate these flow down expectations of what's in the common agreement. Great. Thank you. And Laura, any, any final thoughts for our group from you? Well, I would just say you're starting to see um, organizations, you know, begin to put out press releases and start to make it known broadly that they are going to um, apply to be a QHIN. So I, I think if, if, if I was a, a provider, I would be starting to look around and, and try to identify where um, are the QHINs or, or where is the QHIN that kind of meets the, the conditions that they have established for participation. And I think it's important to start thinking about that. You know, what, what are the things that um, as, a, as a provider that you are looking for in your QHIN? You know, what is their governance structure? Um, what is their pricing structure? You know, you need to be able to compare pricing across the QHINs. What are the other products and services that, that your QHIN is going to offer besides just the, the connectivity to other QHINs? What kind, of, what kind of support services do they have for you in terms of help desk and other things that you might run into as a, as a part of your day-to-day -day operations? So I think it's really important now for folks on the call here or, or, or any others to begin to evaluate what are the important things that your organization needs and is looking for in a QHIN and to establish those parameters as you go out and you start to um, make decisions about what QHIN you want to participate in because there are going to be multiple choices and and you know this is a, a situation where organizations are are going to be able to make decisions based upon a set of criteria that um, are important to that organization so i i would encourage people to start thinking about that now because the decision is probably going to be in front of you within the next 12 months great yeah, it's, it's, it's so great to talk to all of you and hear all of your different perspectives and, and you're all bringing up such great points. It's, it's amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, David, anything from your perspective, any final thoughts for our group here that we have on the line? Sure, and just want to reiterate, I just can't say how important it is, particularly given the group that's gathered here to comment on the regulatory issues, um, both the good and the bad. Um, the other thing that I look at is but the biggest challenge is getting mind share in this very complex environment. And that is how do you sell the benefits that are gonna get somebody to pay attention to what it is that needs to be done at the individual and the provider and the community level in order to make a success of this. Um, I've been doing this kind of, waiting for this kind of thing for almost two decades now and, and think it's a brilliant idea but just because we build it does not necessarily mean they will come. Um, and unless we can generate the enthusiasm for the benefits that will accrue to the organizations and to the individuals, I don't think we can be successful. All right, Sean, any final thoughts? Um, you know, I, I, I second everything that was just said. I think more, a final thought here, I think the first word in TEP is, is one of the most important important words, trust. And, and so, you know, whether at every level of information exchange, starting with all of us as patients, 
we have to trust that our information is being shared for the right purpose and the right reason and that mm -hmm. and then that trust flows through this entire framework and for any of us working at any any one of those levels we have to be asking the questions about whether or not that trust is in place whether or not what processes do we need to put in place to garner that trust what what kind of information do we need to provide across all of our constituents to make sure that trust follows because if, if folks trust in it then they'll participate and we'll achieve the benefits. Great. And an earlier point that, that David touched on is, you know, patients, patients are either, you know, one one of two two ways. It's like they they want access to their data or they do not want their data to be shared, right? So um, great to 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 kind of touch on that trust aspect of this. Um, you know, as consumers, we all are of healthcare. Um, George, any final thoughts? Yeah, just really excited to see where we go from here. It's been a really long, um, repeated journey for HIE, you know, dating back to, mm -hmm. to Rio's and even before then. Um, and then meaningful use and all the local, state, national HIE activity that's occurred over the last decade. I think we've bounced back and forth between, you know, uh, market um, incentives um, and government's action. Um, this kind of falls uh, somewhere in between there. Uh, so, so really excited to see where this takes health information exchange. Hopefully it gets us exactly where we're uh, planning to go. Um, I would say uh, for anyone who's looking uh, to stay informed, uh, healthit.gov, a lot of good information there, as well as the Sequoia Projects website. They have a dedicated RCE page. Uh, look for updates there. Um, really enjoyed being here today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And I will I will thank everybody that's posed questions. It's been great having the engagement and the interaction with those of you on the line. Um, I will plug two blog posts that we have out on the Lineate website. Um, check them out if you have time. One being the TEFCA, Everything Healthcare Organizations Need to Know. And then we also have a blog post on how state HIEs are advancing interoperability. So check those out. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists. It has been such great conversation. I think we kept it pretty high level, which was good for our initial poll question that we had. So um, I guess I guess we did it, guys. We, we got through our panel and, and it was great. And I think we really, really informed those that aren't really sure what TEFCA even is. So um, definitely excited. I, I share the excitement to see where this goes and I thank you for your time. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.